Hello, Tom Lavecki here with the latest and special edition of the New Theory Podcast. I'm in for about 500 shows deep. I don't think I covered anything this crazy. The next guest is a friend, she's a personal friend, but nevertheless, her story has been the craziest story you're ever going to hear. Oprah, Dr. Oz, a book, and more. I'm here with my esteemed co-host, Jason J's for Capital. Jason, how are you doing today? Good evening, Tom. I'm excited for this one. This is this is a roller coaster here. Yeah, this is a biggie. So you're gonna want to stay tuned for this one. And uh, if you got to step away, pause it because this is a cliffhanger. Before we uh, start, Jason has been very good. Jason Capital now offers credit repair. Link will be below. Mention new theory, get a hundred bucks off. We all know why we need good credit whether it be buying a house, buying a car, even like car insurance is linked to having good credit. So check out JSV Capital Credit Pair, link below. So without further ado, I'm going to interest you, Barbara Reifel, uh, who was married to an actual body snatcher. And we're going to talk about details on how Michael Mastro Marino illegally harbored the corpses as a, as a, you know, as a kind of dentist and did some crazy stuff. Barbara, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. It's great seeing you. How Thank you, doing? you. I'm doing good. I'm, you know, I should look like I'm 90. I should be probably six feet under, but I'm here. Well, if you were, <laughs> hopefully it'll keep your, uh, your, your limbs intact. Okay, so we're gonna start off, right? Okay, so anybody who does another story, um, she married uh, a brilliant, brilliant, handsome doctor Michael Mastro Marino. You see the beautiful young couple there. Um, this was on Discovery Network. I mean, pretty much everyone pretty much covered this. Uh, so I'd like for you to start. How did you meet Michael initially, and how did you guys start uh, courting? Um, you wouldn't believe uh, how we met, but it was in a tanning salon in Brooklyn. <laughs> what part? <laughs> I, I was working there. You know, I... I was pre-med. I was taking, I decided to go into, um, you know, journalism, medical journalism, taking courses, working at my friend's tanning salon at night, dental, dental assistant and during by, by day. And this gorgeous man walks in, thought he was a bodyguard for a big mobster that used to frequent there. I won't mention names, uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, very, very sharp guy. So then he walks in right behind him and um, holds the door for him. And it just, it turns out that it was uh, his neighbor, not his bodyguard and a friend, you know, mutual friend. So we just, it was just kind of meant, to, I, I have to say it, it was just meant to be. It was sort of like the kismet that you just, it just happened. What year was this? Yeah. Magic. <laughs> what, year, Barbara, what year was this? Oh, what year was this? Um, 1989. Oh, wow. Okay. So now you meet this handsome guy. Um, not only was he, a, people, when people call him a dentist, it minimize, not that anything wrong with being a dentist. I have a good friend of mine is a dentist, but he was an oral maxillofacial surgeon, which yes. requires a larger degree of training and so forth. Where was he in his education? Was he a doctor yet? Was he going to school? Where was he when we first met him? Well, when I first met him, he was uh, a dental student. He was actually like in his freshman year uh, as a dental student in NYU. President of his class was, I mean, he was just like picture perfect. Any girl, uh, most probably most girls did want to, you know, and mo most girls probably did. But anyway, I'm just lucky I have no disease. That's all I have to say. But anyway, um, he, uh, you know, he was everything. I mean, he was just, he was this football guy from, he was at Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. He was a Pitt Panther. He was becoming a surgeon, uh, just a family guy, loved his nieces, loved his family, you know, good to his parents. All his friends loved him. He was godfather to so many kids. I, I don't even know how this happened, like what, what to say. You know, I thought I was marrying my dream. So basically. then you started, you started courting, you started dating. There's a nice picture of you guys, champagne. What was yeah. it like in the early years? And then tell us about, you know, your, your actual wedding and stuff. Well, 
you know, dating, uh, I have to say, and I've said this a couple of times, there are a couple of like scary moments dating because his, his feeling for me was so strong that uh, it was almost violent. Oh, if that makes any sense. And, you know, when somebody cries to you, this big, big man who lets you in to this really strong exterior and uh, cries and apologizes and wants to, you know, what did I know? I was in my early 20s. I forgave him, got back together, thought, still thought it was the dream that I was having. You know, my whole dream life was ahead of me. And um, we got married in Brooklyn. And uh, it was just... I. I it really was a dream. I don't even know what the hell happened. Can I curse? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So you what married. What the fuck happened? Excuse my so language. <laughs> so here's where, here's where, and like Barb was a friend and ironically, we never talked about this because I respected her as a friend. We never, of course, I had some questions, but I'm never going to go this in depth. One thing I, I, think I, had, I wondered about, and I didn't realize this until I read, you know, read up in the media where he was had a very successful practice, yeah. but then he had some issues where he lost his license, which may have led to the body snatching. So walk us through kind of what happened. Give us like, you know, did you have a house on the hill and how things were good, and then he lost his license. Kind oh, of yeah. Well, we had we had a beautiful life in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. You know, right. the mansion, the house, you right. know, the life on paper. And, uh, you know, he got caught up with drugs with his co core assistant girlfriend. Oh. So... You know that that's that story. <laughs> um, but, there's, but there's a lot of pictures with you guys, and there's pictures with the kids, and a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, was it more of like a duplicitous double life where he held it down yes. at home, and then he was like a different man. Or were Absolutely, there a, lot, a lot of red flags. One hundred percent double life. Okay, and um, he was very. You know, he used to let me in, you know, he was always that very strong, silent type. So when he let me in, when we were together in our younger years, I thought it was very special. I'm like, wow, I'm so special. Yeah. And then when we were married with the younger kids, it wasn't the case anymore. He was like completely like disengaged from all of us. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, showed love, but like he was, he became, na you know, nasty and all that and just not nice and a little bit above us. And uh, yeah, he did le lead a different, a completely double life completely he had the affair with the and he had many affairs i came to find out many mm. i had no idea so he it was you know sometimes they say love is blind i literally allowed my love for him to blind me like in this picture that picture um he actually had come out of rehab oh and so that was his last rehab in virginia three months where you know, he kind of had like, that's when he had his good run of, mm -hmm. but he had been in like three rehabs before then. So oh. this really amazing, brilliant guy that everybody just wanted to either be near, screw, have his money, be friends with, do business with, or whatever else. Um, he really, he really put on a show for everybody. And inside, I think, just think that he was, I don't know, I think he was tortured. I think that he, you know, had that, he always said he had the devil nipping at his heels you know what was he in what was he in rehab for what drug demerol mm. he used to shoot up demerol that he used to give patients to but when he was with his uh, you know the girl that you know that was in his office he they would do i think it's called eight ball is that what it's called when you do the um you do both things you do coke and the uh what do you call it what's it called uh, demerol so um, Demerol and Coke, and they would do it like like a high low sort of thing. Jason, don't play. No, uh, uh, I can't believe I can't even think of it. What do they call it? The, no, I, oh heroin. I can't. I couldn't think no. of heroin. So Demerol's no. like heroin. No, no, he didn't do heroin. But what Demerol do? Demerol does the same effect. What does it do? It just completely like knocked him. Like he just like wow. just chilled him out, and I guess he was just he just flew on it. So w when you first got together, did he, he already had money. He had the car, he paid for the wedding. The money was there. Um, or did you guys struggle in the beginning? And then he really started to make it. Well, his parents, his family, he was the kind of guy, this is what really impressed me about him. He was the kind of guy that wanted to make it on his own. His parents had some money. My parents really didn't have money. And they actually paid for a good part of the wedding, you know. Oh. So it was really like traditional in that way. Oh, sure. Never the wife, wife's mom to pay, yeah. Wait, say it again. 
Yeah, it's traditional in Italians for the wife's mom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Italian and Jewish. I'm like like everything. You just uh, name yeah. it. That's, I'm, you know, like a melting pot. But, um, you know, and you, leading up to everything, the lifestyle, he tried to make me feel special. He would want to pay for things for me. And I was a really independent girl. Like he wanted to drive me to and from work to make sure I got there and back. I'm like, listen, I was good before I met you. I'm good now. You do not, please don't walk me through everything. I love you, but you know, so he was like a bit much like he was, but I, I loved him for it. Um, yeah. but he really tried to take care of me and the and wealth part of it. But what were you going to say? No, go ahead. Kid, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, yeah, we did struggle. We struggled in the beginning because he did not want to take money from his parents. And he was uh, a starving, we could say a starving uh, resident in the medical field, you know, in, in Bellevue. And they really made no money until he was able to moonlight. And then I helped him with the moonlighting and I had my own job. You know, I worked for a, a Perry, Perry Donison, an oral surgeon in the city. So, Interesting. You so know, this is the, so this is the, is 89 you meet him, 90s, you joke. That's, that's the party still going on from the 80s. I mean, you can't sit there and say that you guys weren't going out to the bars and the clubs and you didn't see him interact in drinking and drugs at that point. Yeah, no. So that, so at 30, so at midlife, he decided to go through it. He didn't do anything when he was younger with you. Or drank. He used to tell me I don't drink. And then yeah. he would drink and he would be fine. Uh, like he would yeah. drink a lot of drinks. I never really saw him lose it. Yeah, He was always like, together yeah. i mean there was one time where he was just excuse my language he was a complete asshole in a right. bar and i had you know i was trying to like these a couple guys were looking at me and he's dancing with me and of course i'm sure he got pissed off these guys looking at me and i ignored the whole thing i could see that, ignoring it and he started lifting his hand up my like lifting my skirt up putting my his hand up my skirt to show like she's mine, like hip right. fucking caveman. Excuse my language. Yeah. Should I just say excuse my language for the entire time? The book is coming out. Really. We just got a good hot take for our short. So thank you for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, the Brook that's Brooklyn in me, but I'm sorry. But anyway, and I and I got mad at him and I pushed him away. I'm just like, stop it, stop going, stop it. Like he was embarrassing me lifting my skirt up. And I walk away and he took my arm and he went to grab me and I pulled away from him. And that night was a violent night. That, that night he ended up smashing my face into the seat. Cause I, yeah. And I, I, my cousin was driving and he was in the back seat. He took me by the hair and he smashed me like smashed my face into the seat because of that interaction. And I told him, I mean, I was, I walked out. I didn't speak to him. I think for a few weeks or whatever, I didn't, wouldn't, let him. I told my girlfriend who I lived with, don't let him into the door. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see him. I don't want to talk to him. And lo and behold, you know, the love, the cries, the cries, the apologies, the begging, groveling. I took him back. Now, yeah. respectfully, when when he you know became a surgeon and started making some good money prior to him losing his license, living in Angle Cliffs, um, did you kind of fall into the life? You know, stay home uh, housewife. You know, uh, uh, Saturday tea. Uh, shopping, <laughs> you know, no, all the couturement that would go. Like, it's kind of like, you know, hey, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it correctly, and I want all the couturements that are associated with it. So, w w what was your lifestyle like for you, Barbara, during the good period before the arc and before it kind of fell apart? Well, the lifestyle for me was really, it was all about my kids more than anything. Okay. I was, I did not want, I did not want a nanny. I didn't want anybody living in my house. I wanted to raise my kids myself. And I did have a cleaning girl and he, they used to call me the warrior on the block because I didn't have somebody taking care of my house and my kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they all, you know, the nanny got up with the kids. I got up with my kids, yeah. you know, so um, I did have somebody help clean the house, but you know, I was not the, the country club doctor's wife. Got it. I was not, you know, I didn't come from that. I didn't grow up in that. And, God bless anybody who, who is like that. I had friends that lived that life yeah. on the same block. Still in my life, they, they had that life, but it just wasn't for me. So um, I was a bit of, you know, I just kind of did it myself and I just want to make my family happy. I try to make Michael happy, the house, the home, like make a good home for everybody. 
That's basically what my life was. We had nice things. We yeah. definitely had nice things, but never over the top ostentatious, you know, maybe well, like. We'll get there because there's starts that he has a different career trajectory, which we're going to talk about in a second. So let's kind of wrap <laughs> up his career in legitimately legitimate um, medicine, if you will, or dentistry. Um, yeah. You said on Oprah. I want to hear you better. I'm sorry to cut you up, Barbara. But you said on Oprah that you found him with like a needle hanging out of his arm. He was a pretty bad way. Walk us through that. Oh, uh, well, that's that. Which, okay, what time was that? The needle in his arm. I think okay. that was before when he, he on or about when he lost his license. Because there were two, there were, there was a time where his mother caught him shooting up. <laughs> I know. Um, so his mother caught him shooting up. Uh, when we were we, we were moving from we had to move from Inglewood Cliffs because the money wasn't there, and I didn't know where the money was going. I had no idea that he, you know, was having the drug problems already, and that he was, I would say, probably funding his drugs, funding his girlfriend, and you know, needed to be the big man everywhere, and was half like, was half brain dead, and I didn't even know it. I mean, he was so sharp. He was, he was such a master sociopath, but finding that, and there's another time in his office that they found the needle in his arm, hanging out in his arm. And she had fled. I found out a long time after that she was in that bathroom with him and she took off, but nobody told me. The girl. So it, it was, you know, the, yeah. uh, the wife is always the last to know. Yeah, but um, I'll never be a wife again. <laughs> so, now, so, now, so now you, okay, so now he has a drug, yeah, drug, a drug addiction. He loses his license and he finds a new career path, which we're going to get into body snatching. Yes. How did he initially get into it? Well, once it came out of the rehab, that three month rehab, he really struggled and he was thinking about going back into the business, back into you know, oral surgery, some kind of like medical situation. And he knew he had hands of gold as a surgeon. He really did. Yeah. Um, and he struggled and he would do simple things like clean the, I don't know, clean the barbecue and like, didn't even know what to do with himself, you know? And he was thinking, what am I going to do? He was figuring it out. He was sit with paper and pen and, you know, a long time ago, that's what we did. We didn't really have all the technology we had today. And, you know, and he was, he just came with up with this idea about like <sighs> tissue banking, tissue, you know, tissue procuring, because he wanted, he wanted to not, because I told him, if you're going to do anything, you cannot be around Deverell because I don't care if they hold the keys to the cabinet. You're going to, you're just putting your life in, in danger. You're putting your whole, your life, our lives, everybody in danger. So, and that's what he did when he was a, a surgeon is put a, himself wait, wait, as well as a lot of lives in danger, shooting, sir. like putting people to sleep, going to shoot up and then falling asleep while they're, you know. So, so, they're, so, so the theory was if they're dead, they can't be on drugs. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could hear you guys better. It no, sounds, no, 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 what I'm saying is the theory may have been I'll work with dead people because they can't be on drugs. Exactly. Yes. Like that logic. Okay. Exactly. All right. So, so but hold on. So, I, and this is part of the story that I know we did talk about this. He started snatching bodies and he started making some big, big money. Give us how, like, when things started changing with the cars and the flash, and, and then we'll get into, like, you know, you're like, whoa, this is what's going on here. Well, this is the thing about Michael. We all knew he had the propensity to make money like in business, he would, you know, you know, ex exponential in business, whatever he did, he did well. Oral surgery bored him. That's what he said. Oral surgery bored him. So once he got into this and, and money started coming in, he took me to a house and I didn't know he bought it already, but he said, what do you think? You know? And, uh, and I was like, well, it's, it's homey. I said, it feels like our old home in Englewood cliffs. It's just a little smaller. A little smaller, but it's homey. It feels like warm. I feel the warmth. And that was more I was what I was into. I wasn't into like mansion, like coal, 
you know, I felt like we were se too separated. But um, and yeah, so it just it just came because we had it before. We had things before. We had a nice car before, and then you know you you hit rock bottom, and I thought I was going to be. I, I am. I ended up living with my parents anyway, my mother, um, and but you think that everything's just going to crash and burn and you're just ready for anything. So all of this that was happening, I just took it in stride and I was like, all right, this is happening. Okay. We're going to get a house. We have a couple of nice cars. Okay. This is good. But I didn't, I, I never like went nuts with any of the finances. I didn't even know how much money we had. I well, put the trust to, in him. That when he, he went made to rehab. Money. What's it again? When he went to rehab. Yeah. Did, did he, he, he lost everything. He's sitting at home cleaning the grill. You're saying, yeah. So how is the mortgage? How is the bills? How's anything being paid? Disability. Disability. Yeah. How much yeah. You get on disability. Oh yeah. No, he had a policy. He had a good policy. Oh, disability. Okay. I, I was into um, fitness training. Yeah. And so I had my, I started my own business with fitness training and, you know, for moms like pure fit mama, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I, he would make fun of me because his disability made more money than <laughs> my little helping ladies out get in shape, you know? So he was just like still an asshole. Like he had like two weeks of humility out of rehab <laughs> wow. two, And then, you know, it all started, but yeah, the, the disability but, I think is what really. Okay. So it does. doesn't buy the house or no, the car. That's so when he started making the money. So right, after is he going point, to like is he like leaving for the day in the morning and say bye hun kissing you goodbye and going to the office yeah, like what right. is he, he doing to show that he's he would, doing something for the money? He would get he would get phone calls that um and he'd say uh you know do you, did you talk to the family like he would say things along the lines of what was going on with you know the business whatever business this was as far as no, body sense. snatching or procuring right. tissue from the Wait, so you know, deceased working oh. at home on the phone and you see he's working so you see he's doing something oh no no i've seen yeah i even and even I just don't know what it is yeah uh, well it was pretty creepy when he said he's going to be taking tissue from um dead bodies and he's going to be selling it to um, companies. Yeah. He had worked with this Rege regeneration technologies company when he was a neural surgeon. He would he did like kind of this patent or research. He said RTI stole a patent from him, but um, but yeah, he would work. Yeah, he, had, he was yeah. constantly constantly working. But and he presented it to you like it was normal. This is the industry, and this is okay. I mean. I, you well, know. Yeah, like it was yeah. kind of creepy to me. Like he just said, just tell everybody I'm in research. Like he, right. I couldn't, I didn't even know what to tell people because he went from being an oral surgeon and all of a sudden I'm going to be telling people, yeah, he's cutting up dead bodies. Well, th this is this, <laughs> this is where it gets good and interesting. Not good, <laughs> not good for Barbara, but good for the story. Sorry. Yes. But this is where it gets interesting where you get like 10 to 15,000 a body in that kind of black or gray market. Because obviously if you have a tissue bank, you should procure it from honest sources, should be disease-free, protocols, and that kind of stuff. So he kind of took it among himself to partner with kind of sketchy funeral homes and basically take grandma's stuff out and replace it with PVC piping and all that kind of stuff. So give us like some of the stuff that he did and that you unearthed afterwards that are that is like that makes the story extremely insane. Yeah, well, I gotta tell you, the funny thing is, is with that whole PVC situation. It's hard. I can't describe to you that he didn't go to Home Depot to get PVC pipe and do this. That's the one thing about him that I know was actually dictated by the, I don't know what, it, the, by the companies. I mean, the FDA saw this whole thing. They, I, he, he, this is what he's telling me. But he said, he showed me a kit. He said, that RTI is funding all of this, that he's, they're getting the kits. I'm like, okay, like anything he told me, I didn't have to do with the business. So I'm just like, and the funny thing is like Joe, his partner who would like to me was seem shady. I'm like, watch out for him. I don't trust him. Look at what I was telling. Look who I was telling not to trust Joe. Well, so, Michael. so he started, he, so he started now. Did he work with like a lot of funeral homes? Was it, a few, and then, like, how did he get it started? 
I think he would, he originally tried to do this through the hospital, but I think that was all, um, as he said, locked up. Well, right. He was to do it illegally. <laughs> right. But he, like, even he, I, when, I think. Person's skin. Yeah, I need to like, yeah, I, I think he tried to do it through legal channels, but he, uh, okay. he was getting locked out of all the hospital stuff because it was already racked up by other companies or something. I don't know. Um, but either way, because you have to forgive me because I was not directly involved. This is the stuff that I would hear. He would like yeah, just say yeah. out loud. Yeah. So, um, but as far as uh, how he started, I think I just think he just went from literally went from funeral home to funeral home, like cold calling. I think he just used to cold call. That's guts, man. I can't. I'm still getting Tom to cold call. That is guts. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it's, I got to tell you. I, is it legal? This might be a dumb question. If no, the family, no, 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 no. If the family gives consent, yes. is it legal? Yes. If the family gives consent, it's right. absolutely legal from what I understand, from what, you know, I've yeah, heard. Yeah, but there's, there's, okay, so, and Barbara, I'll, like, because I've, like, followed your story even before I met you. Um, um, so he would, he would basically harvest these, these tissues yeah. And, and so forth, right? So where it became illegal, I believe, I believe in certain circumstances, if somebody gives consent, you can go, you can take them, and, but there's like protocol and testing. He would basically work with sketchy guys, pay access to He was it. sketchy. So yeah, yeah he, he was working with sketchy cash, guys. He paid cash <laughs> to, the, to, the, um, to the funeral homes, which were half mobbed up anyway. They took the extra cash. He would come in at night, chop these bodies up, stitch them back up and then put like piping and like mattresses, pillows and all stuff to beat them back up. <laughs> is that, was in, did you read that? Is it, was that yeah. in there? Cause I don't even know. Yeah, pretty much. And really? then he would sell these tissues, which were HIV infected, cancerous, hep C. Yeah. But here's the part I don't get Barbara. And he would um, get 10 to 15,000 per body. Right. The part I don't get is, the person he sold it to didn't test it. There you go. So what was happening? Was it were they buying it for cheaper because it was black market? Do you know that part? I never understood why they were buying these like disease. Oh, all right. So you don't. Okay. So the, yeah. the way it worked. Okay. The people that bought this tissue, the big companies, he would have to sell. Not sell. Excuse me. He would have to send a sample to them they would test it and put it through their whole sterile technique right they would have to test it then he would they would get the okay or whatever and then he would he would send the um the rest of the tissue from that sample right because it was approved but he and would only have use sterile technique but let me finish sure. what he was doing and he said that he got this okay from the company or got the idea from the company, he literally was switching up. He had a whole freezer of bad tissue that didn't meet the criteria. He would save the good blood, extra good blood from the good donors, the very few good donors. Mm -hmm. And he would send the sample of the good blood yeah. mm -hmm. and send the bad tissue behind it. They found this all out through forensics, what he was doing. Mm -hmm. That is the most terrible part, even beside, besides desecrating, you know, people, graves, you know, people that were dead and of loved ones and things like that. Even beyond that, to put other lives in danger and take it upon yourself to be like God and say, all right, I'm going to do this. Sterile technique is going to take care of it all because we know everything. But nobody, nobody dies healthy. So watch, this is important. And, uh, and yeah. I can echo this. So it's believed that thousands of people, not hundreds, thousands, thousands of people got sicker because of his dirty tissue. And I don't know if they ever came up the exact number, but I believe hundreds most likely died earlier than they would have because of what he did. It was insane. Like, you no, know, but I'm saying hundreds. I didn't hear about the, that. I didn't hear piece, about numbers right, like but that. I'm saying the pieces that he's taking from the cadavers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The person's dead. 
They yes. died of something, of some sickness. So it right. has to be all bad. I mean, unless it was a car accident or something fatal like that. But most of the time, it's not, not, yeah, no, no. But if the, generally, if you're older, it could be natural causes. Um, I don't know the incidence of you know illness versus non. But what we're saying is communicable, yeah. meaning if you have HIV, it's in the tissue. If you yeah. have cancer cells, they're there. If you right. have um, uh, Hep C. And the other part is a lot of these viruses and ailments live on in the tissue and kind of don't die, which makes well, it. Well, they do. They do live on because he was keeping viable tissue. He had, he had some kind of frozen. Um, uh, what's it called? Dry ice. He had dry ice, and he, that's how he would send, I guess, whatever samples he had. I remember that from the beginning because he started out in our garage. Well, that's us. the part. That's the part I've always been meaning to ask you. <laughs> Was that was that you're in this new big house? I don't know if he was driving a Ferrari, whatever he was driving, big, big, big money. And he had these like these freezers with locks on them. And like Barbara, don't touch those, you know? Like there had to been a party that the Brooklyn girl came out and said, This something's going on here. No, you know I mean? not I gotta tell you, I thought I said to myself, All right, I know you're just getting your lab set up, you got your, you know, you got your office, you got your lab, you got all that, but honestly. I got to say, my kids were around and I, I know he didn't want the kids to get into that. Mm -hmm. So that was my thought is like, all right, well, we will just keep the kids away. Or if like we had neighbors over, you know, I had a, a friend come over, his, her husband actually opened the freezer, one of the freezers, I guess it didn't have a lock on it, but he opened the freezer and the big black bags were there. And, you know, we say he did, he was in research. I knew what was, what was in the in the bags, mm -hmm. I had an idea. I didn't know exactly what was in the bags, but you know, as far as like being some kind of tissue of some sort, um, did I know that that was probably all of the disease tissue? No, because that's probably, I have to say, where else would he keep it? He wouldn't keep it on premises. He, he I kept just it. want to know, like what, like, did he run out of like, was it, everybody's 15,000, let's just say. So you get three bodies a month or four bodies a month. You make 50 grand. Was he sitting there going, I got to make a hundred grand. And I only got. Uh, yeah, that's with that's oh, I, uh, he wasn't making 45,000 a month. He was making like 45,000 a week. Oh, what, okay. So <laughs> that's my point. He didn't have to use the bad cadavers. He could have used good ones and be, been yeah, not exactly. okay, but and it wouldn't have been as bad as it was. Correct. Right. Right. The DA actually asked him that in the, um, in the DA's office, or I guess when they were interrogating him, you know, making a deal or whatever. And she asked him and he said, greed. So she asked him, you could have done this legally. And Always he said, greed. Thing. It's never enough. 50,000 a week is not enough for people. I know. Yep. And I used to say, you know, honey, how, how am I ever enough? Like, you know, you're always like right with the business business. Who, who knew? Who knew he was like dipping it everywhere? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. I gotta say about that. I don't even know now, how, how, how even satisfied anybody. How long anybody was the run? What? We know he's making millions, but how long was a year? Yeah. How long was the run where you had a good, fun run financially before it all came crashing down? And how and how did it crash down? Um, so two thousand. It wasn't long. It was like a couple of years. It was like just starting to feel comfortable not even i wasn't even thinking about the the cushy part of it i was thinking about having my husband back were you, you know? away, were you low-key squirreling away money or like hiding oh i i should have i should have squirreled and i i was told that too late i probably squirreled ten thousand dollars away just to save my kids and give them a little like christmas and the necessities and doctor's appointments and whatever else yeah. you know like yeah. I, at the very last minute you probably had that in a shoebox. Uh, all right. No, so, actually, you know where I had it? I, I can't tell you because it's a secret. There you go. <laughs> it's yeah, no way. So, so, okay, so it was a few years doing the harvesting, made an F ton of money. You know, obviously the, the marriage was good financially, but not, you know, you guys weren't super close. When did everything crash down and how did it crash down? Well, everything crashed down when he came back from a Princeton conference and said barb i don't know what's going on i'm gonna have to freeze everything something's wrong 
the 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 guy there I, I forgot the name of the company um oh my god I, i'm sorry i forgot the name of the it's one of the processing companies the tissue processing companies and he had said uh, he he told them listen things are not matching up with the phone numbers we're calling phone numbers and nothing it's it's bogus phone numbers so they must have started an investigation on him and i found papers now this is this is what happened it happened uh around September of 2005, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, it's a long time ago already. But yeah, so that's how it ha that's how it started. And then all of a sudden, he was like, I got to go see these guys. I got to go see these guys in Philadelphia. I got to go see the guys in New York. God help them if they lie to me. If they're doing something, and he's saying this to us, if they're doing something wrong, and he put on such a good act, unbelievable for his parents for me for his attorney who was his cousin he lied to all of us he did he i know i know mario he did not tell mario the truth he played anybody he could and that's just the way he did it but he crashing down crashing down um that's when things start to to like chip away crumble things were getting hot and then after that, he got word, I guess he, he hired Mario and he got word that, uh, that the grand jury wanted to, uh, him for him to come in and answer some questions, just answer some questions. Mm -hmm. And he thought he had it down. He thought he was, he thought, you know, he's like, no, they want a bigger fish that, you know, I don't know who they're looking for, but, and he just kept this facade up every which way he could. There's no, he would not admit it for his life. He just wouldn't admit it. I mean, even like I said in my book, um, he sat, he took me into the bathroom and he said, why? He, you know, he was like, listen, should I run? I, and I asked him, are you guilty? And he said, no, I'm not. I said, then stay and fight. Stay well, and fight. He, uh, he um, fought the case and if I remember oh, wow. If I remember correctly, the state was going after him. Of course, the feds scooped it up. And was it the Southern District and the Philly District battling it out for your case because it's high profile? Well, it never went federal. The feds never took it. Really? So, yep. All of them were were state jurisdictions. Okay. So it was um, it was Jersey. It was Philadelphia. No, Jersey. Jer Jersey just stayed put. From what I understand from the attorneys, yeah. Jersey stayed put. Because they knew that New York and Philadelphia were going to give them enough time to satisfy them. They were trying to save money because however it worked out, it was not federal. It was all. And I think what they were trying to do is lock him down by having all separate jurisdictions and not just federal, like as a blanket, and make things difficult for him. But New, so, York, New York took the lead, I think, eventually with Mike Vecchione, or who was that? Mike Vecchione. Say that again about Mike? Was it Mike Vecchione who interviewed him? Is he oh yeah, he was the detective. So yeah. he he was so comforting and amazing. I, I know he's a detective and he was against my husband. And I mean, he would I, I didn't realize he was at my house at first, but he was the one, I guess, who took Michael to and from the prison. And he also was the one that was a, in the DA's office. Yeah. There was this um the office that I had to go meet him. I met him there. And um Everybody was so gracious to me, which is unbelievable. I mean, it's the DA's office and they're trying to prosecute my husband. And Josh Hanshaft just literally shook my hand and said, I'm so sorry for all that you're going through. I wish you the best. And he's trying to put my husband away. So it was, it was pretty wild. But Mike Vecchione, he was the one who sat at the very end of the table and watched. He was, he guarded, he was at Michael's guard. He like looked, watched out that he didn't disappear and he was there for our meeting so he actually watched michael tell me the truth i don't want to believe it when michael told me that he was guilty of everything and i just pulled away from him and i said you know what i, I just i wouldn't believe it and then he said he, he said something about he's got this whole um this new machine, it's like to cure cancer or something. And I said, what makes you think that you're not going to go dark again? I mean, come on. So Mike, at the other end of the table, I think he could hear us. 
they probably had a microphone underneath the, you know, underneath the table anyway. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. I'm from Brooklyn. I know these things. Right. So, um, <laughs> um, but, and then he was also, Mike was also there for um, my kids when they came to visit. I took them to visit him there uh, and he watched what a sad state that was. Mm-hmm. You know, well, so hold on. I want to. I want to get to what happens next, and it's a, the biggest load of karma you're probably ever going to hear. Uh, unfortunately for him, um, yeah. but so he blows trial. He gets sentenced. I think 15 to plus years. But they go after you financially, and if I remember correctly, kind of talking to you, but also reading, there was like 600k in the bank, and you're like, "Hey, listen, I get you got to take it, but like, can you leave some for us?" And they came and like supposedly scooped it out or like walk us through that. I thought that was a little dirty pool on the the government side. Well, yeah. I mean, they just took everything. It's basically, I mean, the only thing I could say is the only comfort to me was that it was, it was going to go to the families. So I, I literally had nothing. So, you know, the, the money that uh, was in the, from the house that was equity in the house was yeah, actually from his disability and it had nothing to do with the business. They took so, that too or you're at least able to keep that? Wait, say that again? Yeah, they took that too? or were you They took it, to- yeah. Yep. But, because but what they, they did... The forensic account show, hey, this came from the disability and it's not ill-gotten gains? Well, that, what they did was is they, they got me on paper for some kind of... <laughs> it's such a long story. Bottom line is Michael had me sign something on his business, not on his bank account, which I thought that's what it was. He said, I want you to be, you know, vice president on my bank account. And I was like, well, why can't I just be a signer? And it turns out he forged everything anyway, but he had me sign this piece of paper so I I could be, uh, you know, like I could have rights to do whatever I need to do on this um, Metro I forgot what the name of the company that he made, but it, there it was Metropolitan Tissue Services uh, to pay bills of certain things. So whatever was whatever money funneled into that is what they said I owe because oh. both of our names were on it. And I was like, <sighs> you know, I just. But at that point, he's saying she had nothing to do with it. It's on me. They knew I had nothing to do with it. They had surveillance on him from 2004. Right. Okay. They knew I didn't. Jeez. But, Christ. you know, th- what I say is it's only money. I-, I need to be here for my children. If they wanted to make life difficult for me, they absolutely would. They would have absolutely put me through the ringer. They could have indicted me on nothing. So I said, Money is no, just take whatever, whatever it is. And Mario agreed. He said, just don't fight it because I had all kinds of papers. I had signatures of him forging my name. I could have really fought and won, but what am I going to do? Fight for money that should go to victims that all the things that he did to people like that's, that's wrong of me. Um, You know, I can't go do that. Okay. So, so he gets sentenced and I guess the biggest part of the irony is, he comes down with bone cancer of all things, similar to what the stuff he used to harvest. Um, how long was he in jail before he got sick? And as far as you know, what was his time like in jail? Um, I don't, well, I didn't visit him because he had no right to ever see me again. The only reason was that he was dying. Yeah. Uh, and I heard from his family that things were a bit difficult. Like he was put in the hole a couple of times. There were some physicalities, you know, physical violence yeah. with him which i could kind of see and also they would not let him work so they they didn't like his brain in those instances like he he had such a good brain like a smart devious brain that they didn't trust him with the library with the computer with any any electronics whatsoever they didn't trust him with anything so um you know, based his his time in prison, I but it it turns out I, I think he made a lot of friends. He makes a lot of friends everywhere he goes or went. Well, there was there was uh, without giving names, I know you wouldn't anyway. But there was also um, some talk that at the very least, some of the um, funeral homes were mob connected, and then he had some OC connections that may or may not have been involved. Without giving names or anything, can you speak to that? Um. He knew people. 
he knew people, you know, I, there was one uh, guy, I said, I don't know what territory he, he ran. He's not alive anymore, actually. Uh, and I didn't know that. I wasn't told that I found that out. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, he had people, he had friends. His father had friends. His father's no longer here as well. Uh, and his father had friends that made sure that he was okay. And this, this guy, I mean, I'll just call him Lenny. Nobody knows who he is. So Lenny, um, he, well, that was his real name actually. But, um, so Lenny, <laughs> but he's not here anymore. So there's, 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 there's a Lenny still around, so we gotta be careful. Keep going. No, but he's, yeah, he's not here. He's, yeah. he's gone. Oh, okay. now he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Um, but anyway, so Lenny, you know, would call, even when Michael was like in rehab, he would call, make sure the kids were okay, say, how you doing? I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what he, yeah. what he did, but I kind of knew what he did. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask. But I kind of, after Michael was in prison, I'm like, listen, do me a favor. You need to, you need to stop calling me and you need to take care of your friend and make sure he's okay in prison. I need to have a clean slate. I need to make sure my kids are okay. And I need to stay far away from whatever you or anybody else does that I have no idea. And I know it, but I know I need to stay away from it. All right. And this, I was kind about it. Yeah. He was hurt, yeah. but that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, this picture, this picture um, kind of surprised me knowing you as a person and your story. But this yeah. is your ex-husband in the hospice with inevitably about to die. And he still visited him anyway, um, despite I everything did. that happened. So give us how you kind of wrestled with his emotions and how you arrived at say, hey, you know what? Let me go say bye. It was an automatic thing because of the, because of the kind of person I am. When his brother called me and told me he has three months to live, he's, if, if at all, he's got three months to live, he's going to die. He's got stage four cancer through his whole body. Um, and I cried for a minute. And then all my fears just melted away. I felt relief. And I said, well, now is the time to forgive, to make peace and forgive and ask my kids if they want to go see him and let's go and, you know, say goodbye. Let's just, you know, show a little something. And, you know, it, honestly, I think it was it was the best choice. There was no other choice for us, for me. And then my kids were willing. My older one, literally, I had to stop him from visiting him because he wanted to punch him in the face because he became big. He yeah. was this big dude. And he remembers father pushing yeah. him around. That's the one on the left with the bald head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and he and he. Um, I was like, honey, if, you, if you're if you going to be violent with him, maybe it's not the time to go visit him. Maybe you should wait. But it turns out maybe less than a year later, maybe months later, we found this out and he had a completely different attitude toward it. And it was, I have to say, it was, it was good for all of us. It was good. I know it's, he was a monster in the world's eyes. Even in my eyes, he was a monster. But the father of my kids... Yeah, you know, and and I did say this once before. We met when we were young, so we were like in our, you know, I was twenty three when I met him. Um, really, it's like you you almost feel like your family, and how do you hate, you know, how do you, you know how to separate and just draw the line and like, that's it, goodbye. But it's it's almost like your family. It's difficult to like just say goodbye and just right. You know, no, right nobody away. nobody had those intimate moments like. Somebody's family, like you had with him, right? right? Nobody like, saw that. Nobody shared that. Nobody shared a bed. Nobody shared a house, kids, like and all the, that the, stuff. The so better moments. You, of shouldn't, when he feel, was you shouldn't feel guilty of that whatsoever. Yeah, it's. I, I don't. I don't. I don't feel guilty or bad about anything, and I can only. I can only apologize for his actions of what he's done, but it, I didn't do it. I didn't. The only thing I could say is. I mean, back when he was on drugs, I probably saved his life maybe, I don't know, maybe like two two or three times. Um, saving his life caused all of, you know, if saving his life caused all of this and I had a hand in it, that I, that's the only thing I could be sorry for is saving his life. But how do you how do you be sorry for saving someone's life that was your husband and the father of your children and couldn't even help himself? Exactly. You know, cheating or no cheating. He was, he was a human. He was my husband and he was family. So exactly. it's, <laughs> it's hard to say, you know, I should have killed, you know, let him die. But no, but no, I would never, mm -hmm. you know, I could, just can't think that way.
Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll be wrapping up soon, but I also yeah. want to commend you because I met you post the you know, this happened. It was about yes. five years ago yeah. it happened. And, you know, you were struggling for a little bit and you obviously landed on your feet. Your kids are doing great. Um, how did you get by that difficult time? And what advice do you have for people that are watching or listening to how to get through tough times like this? Well, if you go through a difficult time, first of all, I always say, if somebody's there to help you, if just if they have their hand out, please take it. Don't be too proud. Don't be, you know, I, I had such a lifestyle. I literally was on Medicaid for a while. Yeah. I had to make sure that I, you know, took care of my family. Mm -hmm. And if that's what it was going to take, thank God for institutions and in situations like that to help people. So, and even if you don't have family, like there are, there are places to get help to have people protect you and, you know, look at the signs. All I could say is like, don't ignore the signs. Mm -hmm. If, if something doesn't look right, it probably isn't right. If it doesn't feel right, you know, you got to kind of see through the love. And, um, and I, you know, but I can't, the thing is, I can't, I can't regret any step that I've taken. I can't regret it. You know, it's what I did. But as far as heeding caution to anybody else, just, you know, if the signs are there, get out, you know, you should not, I don't, con I don't condone violence at all. I said, when we first got together, I would not accept that whatsoever. And I ended up accepting that a couple of times because it wasn't so frequent. It doesn't matter how frequent it is. If it's even once, it's, it's, it's too much. Wow. So there are lots of things that, you know, from my story that people can learn and um, just appreciation you know, of life and, um, and just find your strength. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going to put uh, Barbara's book up, uh, <laughs> the body Sanders wife, my life with the monster. Um, are you like, do you share your socials? Like does, if somebody wants to reach out, should they reach out to me and I connect you? Cause I'm assuming people yeah. reach out. Uh, what's the best way to handle a post kind of uh, show? Well, you know, I have, I have, I haven't been on it in a long time. I have to be honest with you, since COVID, my book came out right before COVID and there was no way I was promoting a book as the world was falling apart and people were dying. I wasn't doing it. So since then, I really haven't plugged or pushed anything. You know, you kind of reached out and it's like, you know, the Mike Vecchione connection. It's how can you not? It's, you know, and I'd say hi to him for me, please. Would you, but, like, um, if, if, if he's willing to come on, would you be willing to come on with him and have a chat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had his cell number. I I don't have it anymore. Yeah. But um, and I why would I call him socially? You know, it's like he was. Well, he was on. He was, he was on American <laughs> Greed. He was like one of the main guys on American Greed. I remember. Yeah. You know, he he was so professional. He was so kind. He made me feel very comfortable. I can't say enough good things about him. Um, and but as far as reaching me, my Instagram is public. Okay. You know, I. I know my shows, one of my shows or a couple of my shows must have aired or something because I, you know, I, that's when I get like Instagram, but sometimes you get the creepers, you know, you gotta be careful. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you can text me or you can just tell them to reach me, reach me on uh, Instagram. I've, I've been, I've found a lot of very kind people out there and a lot of people that just thank me even for a little inspiration. And that's all I ever wanted is for my story to just inspire people to, to find that strength within themselves and just, you know, good stuff, just good stuff out of the bad stuff. Well, you, you kind of answer my last thought before Jason wraps it up and you wrap it up is, uh, do people ever reach out once in a while? Yeah. Probably when something appears like an older show or repeat or new show that covers it, I assume they reach out. So Jason, any questions before we wrap up? No, I think th this was a great interview. Uh, I really uh, glad I came on and a uh, pleasure to meet yeah. you, Barbara. And and like you said, you know, find the strength in, in the bad times. If that's something we can take away from this interview um, and uh, go out and grab the book. This is one crazy story. Yeah, thank you. And there's always light behind those clouds. I like that. You know, there's always you know, that silver lining sort of thing. Yeah. Seriously, you know. I live in, I still live in my mother's house, by the way. Oh, wow. I came here for, for protection, for security, for, you know, just a, a haven for my children to feel safe in. This mm -hmm. is where I grew up. 
And now I'm taking care of my mother and my aunt because they're older cancer survivors. And you know what? It goes around and, and that's just life. So, mm -hmm. it, and, and honestly, I don't feel ashamed at all that I'm living here with my mom. No. You know, it's like it, certain things in life. It's you just have to get past your own self, your own pride, your own, all of that. You know, it's, Agreed. it just, it, it takes away from you being a human actually. Agreed. But, um, but anyway, so well, yeah. Well, Barbara, great seeing you. I haven't seen you, too. seen you in a while. So great seeing you. Great catching up. We're going to, um, obviously we're going to post this ASAP. Make sure you like subscribe, leave. A word of encouragement for Barbara below. We'll have her back on. We'll have her on with Mike Vecchio, which will be a first. We'll be the first media source to do that. So, uh, uh, Barbara and Jason, thank you guys for being here on uh, the podcast. Take care.